Yeah, so what I'm going to talk about today is really more of a conceptual talk. There's not going to be proofs or theorems or anything like this. It's really just trying to get uh, a new sort of way of looking at different problems and uh, through this new sort of lens of thinking about different active learning problems, uh, what can we, how does it change things? Uh, and so in the beginning, what I'm going to talk about is um, an example that just really just sets up the problem to what I really want to get to. So just bear with me. And this isn't really the application that I really care about, but it's something that it's easy to get this all on the same page. Consider uh, the New York caption contest. So in the back of the New Yorker magazine, each week they have a caption. And what they do is they invite people to uh, submit captions into this caption contest. And so they get about 5,000 a week. And the idea is that some, they get voted on and they you know, win or lose. So this is uh, right after Trump was elected a couple years ago. Uh, and this is a desolate scene. Uh, third place, maybe a second week will go better. Uh, second place, I'd like to see other people. Uh, and first place, the corrupt media will blow this out of proportion. So how these three were decided, of these 5,000 initially, were by this guy, uh, Bob Mankoff. He was the, uh, Captain Cont the cartoon editor at the time. He's now at Esquire. Um, but basically, he had this problem that looking at 5,000 captions every week is extremely mind-numbing. Uh, and so what they'd like to do is be able to actually have, uh, they'd like to crowdsource this opportunity. And so they have 5,000 captions submitted each week, and they'd like to crowdsource this decision of, ah, thank you for that echo. <laughs> uh, 5,000 captions submitted each week, and they'd like to crowdsource this winning, con this caption have people decide who's going to win. So how this would look in terms of a crowdsourcing application, you'd go to this website, uh, newyorker.com slash cartoon slash vote. You see a cartoon, this week's cartoon, let's say. You see a caption. You write unfunny or funny. Let's say unfunny. Unfunny or funny. Let's say unfunny. Uh, and then unfunny or funny. And you'll be patient, he'll grow on you. It's a potted plant. Now, the idea here is what is shown when you press on funny or funny. What's shown next? After you press funny or on funny, what is the next caption that comes up? How is that decided? And you could think of this as doing a non-adaptive sort of experimentation here, where it's just uniform allocation of the 5,000. Every time you click on funny or funny, you see a randomly drawn of these 5,000 each time. Alternatively, it could be an, some sort of adaptive scheme. And by adaptive, I mean that given all the votes I've seen up to the current time, I know that this caption can't, cannot possibly win in the end, so I'm going to stop showing it, something like this. And so we can model this mathematically or as a multi-armed bandit problem by saying that you know, we have n actions we can take. You know, which caption do we show? Where n is the 5,000 captions we can show. And then we're going to model you know, if someone says that it's funny versus unfunny as this Bernoulli random variable with some mean mu i. And then what happens is after some amount of time, the algorithm is going to exit or declare that, yes, I have identified the funniest caption. Uh, Bob, you can go and send this one off, and you can be done for the week. And you want to do this with high probability. So you want to find this argmax of all the mu i's. Again, the mu i is the funniness of the ith caption. So how does this work? So if we have n captions, then uh, we have this empirical sort of amount of funny. This is the empirical number of times that people said it was funny versus unfunny. And we have confidence intervals, because these are a finite number of times we've seen these votes. And so this average number of votes has this confidence interval. And this confidence interval is, I don't know why this is disconnecting and connecting. Uh, these confidence intervals are, go down like something like 1 over the square root of number of votes. Okay? This is coming from a turnoff bound or a Huffington bound, uh, classic empirical process theory. But the idea is that as I get more and more votes, these confidence intervals will start to shrink. So more votes, these confidence intervals will start to shrink. And if our goal is to identify the maximum one, what we can say is that, well, at a certain point, we're going to get to a point that these confidence intervals are going to shrink so much that this top caption is going to have this confidence interval will not interlap with, overlap with any of the other ones. And we can confidently say that that is the best caption. And that is the winning caption, which is great. And if we want to come up with a sample complexity, you know, quantify and characterize how many samples does this actually take to identify this funniest caption, it's really quite simple, really. If delta 2 is defined as the gap between the best mean and the second best mean, delta 3 is the gap between the best mean and the third best mean, and delta i is the gap between the best mean and the ith mean, or caption, then uh, we just pretty much just straightforward set these, mean, these, these gaps equal to this square root. 
basically because this is the gap, this confidence interval has to be shrinking smaller than that gap. Instead of equating these two things, doing some algebra, you can find out that the number of votes you need with a uniform allocation, if everything is sampled the same number of times, is something like n, the number of captions, times the worst case inverse gap. Because right? you need to wait for all of them to get smaller than the worst case, the smallest gap. But this is super wasteful because these captions, I completely oversampled them. I made their confidence interval go way smaller than what they needed to be. It just really needed to be smaller than this blue line. And so the next simplest sort of naive algorithm you can imagine is to simply keep sampling all the captions until one caption is poking its head above the book. You stop sampling the ith caption when its confidence interval does not overlap with any other co caption uh, confidence, confidence interval. Said another way, sorry. Stop sampling the ith caption as soon as you can confidently say that it is, there exists some other caption that has a higher mean. Okay, very simple. Same sort of analysis, you do some counting, you do some algebraic manipulation, and you can show that in this case, this, the number of samples you're going to need is more like the sum of the inverse gap squared, okay? where delta i again is the gap between the true mean of the best caption and the i caption. OK, so we sort of characterized in a very, very simple way in these naive algorithms between a non-adaptive, this uniform allocation of n times the worst case, versus adaptive, which is the average case, uh, n times the average case, if I multiply by n over n here. But we also have this lower bound. That's just the sum of the inverse gaps. And so then it's like, OK, well, they're off by a log n. Um, so people did a lot of work. People did, you know, published dozens of papers. Uh, and we finally closed it and got an algorithm that you know, removes this log n factor. OK. So this is an algorithm I developed. Basically, it's based on the UCB algorithm of or uh, at all in 2002. And uh, it's a very popular algorithm. All you do is you define a confidence bound, it's this empirical mean, plus this little confidence bound that looks like that one on the first slide. Except for instead of the log n here, we've replaced it with this log log term. And what happens here is we keep sampling the catch on the highest upper confidence bound. We keep sampling, keep sampling. It has the effect of minimizing the highest confidence bound. And as we keep sampling, eventually what's going to happen is that these confidence intervals are going to shrink, and we're eventually going to have one arm or one caption poking its head above all the others. And it will continuously be sampled, and so it will be getting lots of, uh, lots of reward, meaning it's getting, always showing the best caption. But because it's always being sampled over and over, that's a very clear signal that that is the best arm, and we can actually declare it as such. And so, OK, that's great. We can remove this log n factor. But who cares about this log n factor? You know, why is it important? And the reason why I want to stress in this talk why we would care, say, about a log factor or something like this is because this is not optimization. This is not you know, analyzing SGD or SVRG or something. We removed a log factor so that now it goes twice as fast. Or we can now you know, not run overnight versus just in like six hours or something. This is really data collection. Right? So this is saying, how many fewer samples do I need and with adaptive data collection versus non-adaptive, it really could make the difference of either measuring a phenomenon or not. And that's why caring about these log factors is actually removing real constant factors that matter. So with these 5,000 captures, log n is about a factor of 9. So you can get away with, you can get the same amount of data, make the same inferences with a factor of 9 less data. And so in, in, in real studies, so on this New Yorker caption contest sort of uh, experiment, we can routinely see gains of something like four to five times fewer ratings than uh, between adaptive and non-adaptive, um, or this log factor of uh, nine. OK, but that's all sort of old work. You know, it's a, from 2014. That's not what I want to talk about today. It's just sort of background. What I want to talk about today is what if n is really big? Like, where a log factor is just missing the point. What if n is so large that it's much larger than the total number of samples that you have? Meaning you have 5,000 captions, but you only have, say, 4,000 measurements you can make. You can only ask for the ratings of 4,000 captions. What can you do in that case? What are the kind of questions you can answer? Well, to set up this problem, you know, going down this road of, well, I only have a very small amount of data. What can I do? We know from upper bounds and lower bounds that if we need an algorithm to stop and declare that it's identified the best arm uh, or the best caption, uh, then you're going to need something like some of the inverse gap squared number of samples. This is what was exactly on the previous slide. 
There's an upper bound and a lower bound. But what about an epsilon good arm? Okay? So maybe looking for the absolute best is just way too much to ask for. What if we had you know, our, our n means here, uh, so our 50 arms, n is equal to 50, and say there's you know, this many good epsilon good arms, how hard is it to find one of these? Is it significantly easier? Turns out no. It turns out no because, uh, th well, we reduce some amount of the sample complexity because now you don't need to have, uh, the, you remove these small gaps. You don't, you know, if you only need to find epsilon good arm, you don't need to distinguish between these top two arms because this just doesn't matter. You're just looking for one epsilon good arm. So there's some savings, but the sum is still omega n. So if n is equal to 5,000, you're still going to need something like 4,000 poles at least, and realistically more like a factor of 10 more than that. But this is super unintuitive because of this example here. This is a matching upper and lower bound. But what it says is that for the lower bound to be proved, it says that your algorithm must run for an amount of time, and then at some current time, it's going to stop and then output an arm, and it has to guarantee that it is the, you know, an arm that is within epsilon of the best. But to guarantee that you're within epsilon of the best, you need to have looked at all your arms, essentially. You need to have looked at all the different captions of the different alternatives to guarantee that you didn't miss one that was better than the one that you found. And so that's why these things have to be order n. But this stopping condition is really killing us. Because, and it's very unintuitive, because if my arms didn't look like this, but it looks like this, where half of my alternatives, so if I have 50 arms, or 50 alternatives, and half of them are epsilon good, the amount of samples that I should need in order to identify one good one should not have to scale linearly with n. Right? Because if I just sample, say, 10 arms, 10 arms randomly, from my set of n, and then just run some algorithm, say little UCB on those 10, I should be able to identify a pretty good one, because with high probability, among those 10, I'm going to get at least one that was epsilon good. And the problem here is actually just definitions. The, this, this need to actually control uh, this PAT guarantee of outputting an arm and declaring that, yes, this is the best arm, I can guarantee it is way too much of a stringent condition for exactly this reason. So what we're going to focus on today is more simple regret algorithms. And what I mean by that is that when does the algorithm start outputting something reasonable? So you're going to run this algorithm. It's going to be collecting data, collecting captions, whatever. And at every single time, it's going to be outputting a recommendation of what it thinks is the best caption at any given time. And when it's outputting that recommendation, when does that recommended caption start becoming epsilon good? By looking at a number of algorithms, it, I can, I'm not going to tell you the algorithm at this moment, but what you can do is you can actually show that there exists an algorithm that if you, if you look at this much more uh, less constrained version of the problem, instead of declaring something, it is when is the, the recommended arm start being good, you can show a sample complexity that's actually scaling like this. Or what this is is the sum over all the arms that are uh, at least epsilon suboptimal scaled by the number of arms that are uh, optimal. Okay, so in this case, for an example, to plug in, it helps to plug in some examples. Here, the number of epsilon arms is n over 2. So this is 2 over n. And then this is something that scales like order n. So this whole term is just like an order 1 term. It's a constant term. Meaning, in these favorable situations, when there's many arms or many alternatives that are decent, you don't need to have a sample complex that scales the number of arms. You don't need to have a sample complex that scales with n. And when you start thinking about this, when you start thinking like this, let, OK, well, actually, the number of samples I have is much smaller. The number of measurements I have to, have to measure is much smaller on the same order of the total number of actions or alternatives I can take. It's, it very quickly makes more sense to not think about the individual alternatives as you know, discrete quantities, and I have you know, n of them, I can line them up and I can look at their means, but actually looking at them as a set. I have this collection of alternatives, and what is the relative value within those, relative quality of those different alternatives? And looking at actually a distribution. Like you can think about this as a probably mass function. Uh, this is the same data on uh, the the same, these plots are the same data, but just viewed in different ways. Now it's just looking at how many arms have mean 0.16, how many arms have mean 
uh, 0.9. And so what we can see here is that if we sampled a caption or an alternative uniformly, or if we sample the caption from this distribution, this PMF, we see that it's extremely rare to get a red one, but it's extremely uh, likely to get a blue one. And if we look at this distribution, this so-called simple you know, setting, we see now that this is lining up with, with our expectations that it's very likely to get an epsilon good one, and it's, very or it's, very, it's just as likely to get a, a, a bad one. And so this perspective of I have you know, a finite number of arms or alternatives. And I'm, I apologize for going back and forth between arms and captions and alternatives. Um, this is vernacular, or this is, this is vocabulary from uh, the multi arm bandit literature where alternatives are arms, and we pull arms to take a measurement. Uh, in this finite arm perspective, we have uh, this expression on the last slide. But then we can multiply by n over n in this infinite arm perspective, where as I let n get very, very large, I'm just looking at this, this distribution. Uh, that's how I'm thinking about this problem. And now this quantity is really just how many samples, how many arms do I have to draw from this distribution? If I think about these, these as just being a distribution of different qualities of arms, how many do I need to draw in order to get one that's at least epsilon good? In this case, it would be about one. It'd be about one. That's how many I would need to draw in order to get at least one that was, or two, I'm sorry. n over n over two is two. I would need to draw about two arms to get one that's epsilon good. And this blue part is basically the expected number of times, on average, I need to pull a suboptimal arm to remove it or to rule it out as epsilon good. And so this sort of sample complexity is, can be broken up. The number of samples I need to solve this problem is the expected number of times I need, expected number of arms I need to draw to get an epsilon good one times the average number of times I need to sample uh, an arm to, a suboptimal arm to determine that it is not good. As n goes out to infinity, we see these two things. This is an order n quantity. This is an order one quantity. Because, and so if I let n go off to infinity, so this is, let's say these means are being drawn from some smooth distribution, let's say, then what we can say, we can actually rewrite this expression uh, in terms of the CDF. So if f is the cumulative distribution function, then I can rewrite this as 1 over 1 minus f of mu star minus epsilon, where mu star is the, be the value of the best possible arm, and then this integral representation. Um, I find this beautiful. Uh, other people don't find this more helpful. But it's, uh, this is really capturing exactly how difficult the problem is. And it's going beyond just these, these, we can plug in the empirical PMFs into this expression and get exactly what we got in the multi arm bandit situation. And we can recover all the known lower bounds and upper bounds. But this perspective allows us to say much more complicated things. And that's sort of the topic of this talk. How can we use this expression and this sort of perspective to uh, solve problems. So getting back to the New Yorker caption contest, how does this help us? How does this new perspective help us? One thing you could do is given some, let's say you have some measurement budget B, we're going to choose the smallest epsilon such that this expression, we're going to, we're going to search over the smallest possible epsilon such that this expression is smaller than B, our budget, because that would mean we have enough samples to actually do this. And then we're going to choose some sample, some number of arms n, that is you know, proportional to this scheme here, because that's the number of arms that we need to sample in order to get one that's epsilon good. And then we'll just run low UCB. Right? That would be sufficient. Problem is we don't know what f is. We never know what the distribution of the arms is. If we knew what f was, basically this distribution of how the quality of the different arms, we'd kind of be done in the first place. And so because we don't know f, we don't know how to choose it. And so what we do is we hedge. We use all value, different values of n. And what I mean by that is if I have a budget of, say, you know, 100,000, maybe I'll use different values of n of n equals 10, n equals 100, n equals 1,000, n equals 10,000, and run different games in parallel each algorithm running its own value of n, and then at each time we're just going to output the best thing at any given time. Very reasonable sort of hedging strategy that uh, can achieve what our results want to do. We want to 
you know, figure out what the optimal value of n is and sample it, and then run our little UCB algorithm on this smaller subset of arms. And if we do that, we can see these sort of results. This is how these algorithms behave. So this is last week's contest with 5,000 captions, 5,400 captions. This is what that distribution looks like, that PMF looks like. Uh, you'll note that if, if this mean is the probability of being funny, there's there are basically only about one or two captions that have a probability of mean of funny greater than one half, meaning that basically <laughs> not even the funniest caption, half the people disagree on whether it is actually funny or unfunny. Country divided indeed. And so if we sample 10 arms from this and we run a little UCB as a function of the budget, that's this line here. It, gets, it drops off quick, this black line. Drop it as a small number of measurements. It comes out, and then it drops down quickly. But because you only sampled n arms, n equals 10 arms, a very small number, you didn't get one of these. You only got sort of a random sample from here. Maybe you only got it to here. And so it converged only to this, this error versus the best um, there. And it never really got any better. And as we sample 100 arms, we get a little better. Or the best arm, it takes a little longer to burn in. But then it eventually converges uh, to some value that's a little better than n equals 10. n equals 1,000 takes longer to burn in, but then it eventually converges to a better location. n equals 10,000, uh, again, burn in, but then it eventually finds the best one. And then blue is just little UCB run on all 5,000 captions, sample without replacement. And so the gain here is that if we had, say, n equals 100, this is a log scale. So this point right here, is about 10 times, uh, yeah, about 10 times uh, fewer samples. So using 10 times fewer samples, we're outputting non-trivial estimates of this, of this you know, pretty good arm. And if we hedge over these different values of n, because there's only four of them, it's only going to basically move this line over just a little tiny amount because this is a log scale. And so what really happens is you get a curve that looks much very similar to this red curve, that is, uh, basically the best of all worlds. You're, by doing this hedging, you're losing almost nothing. And this red curve actually is something more complicated, because if you just averaged over them, you get a line that's actually shifted over. But if you do something more intelligent, you can get this red curve. And that's, uh, you can go check out this paper uh, that we're over the summer to see how you can get that. But it's not really the topic of today's talk. What I really want to stress here is just that by hedging over different values of n, if you have these, the, you should not be thinking about your problems in large action spaces as having n total actions I can take. You have a set of actions, and now you can hedge over different values of actions because your problem could be very, very easy or very, very hard. So this different perspective of when should I, you know, when when is it useful to think about having you know an infinite arm banded approach, and when you start doing these sampling style algorithms. It's useful when the number of actions, the number of arms, is much larger than the total measurements or resources you have at your disposal. Okay? So when does this come up? It comes up in stuff like the New Yorker, but that's not really what I'm interested in. Uh, what I'm really interested in is examples with biology and screens. If you're doing an RNAi screen, where each measurement is putting into is a pipette, doing an experiment, getting some noisy measurement out, they have to repeat several times. Uh, to actually get a, a statistically significant result. How do you allocate those measurements in such a way such that if you have 5,000 genes, how do you, fi how do you find you know, some good subset of those genes that are useful for virus replication or something like this? Maybe you don't need to find all of them. Finding all of them could be statistically impossible. From a, from, a, from a standpoint of sample complexity, you may not be able to identify all the important genes. So why don't we go after trying to identify those that are most important? And also things like uh, combinatorial A-B uh, AB testing inference. So people think of A-B testing as just like, oh, you know, this button's red, or this, this button is green, um, and these sorts of things. But what people are often interested in and concerned about is correlations between different elements on the web page, or correlations between different, you are asked to put in, you know, you are asked to see this subscription, but you like cats, and so I also showed you this other thing on some other part of the site, and then I also did this other thing on the part of the site. And how does that influence everything? Because in reality, 
with a site like Amazon or Facebook or anything, they're not running one A-B test or two A-B tests. They're running thousands at a time simultaneously. And all of them are affecting, all of the, of affecting each other. And so these are really common trial A-B testing problems. And you can actually solve these if you take this infinite arm bandit perspective, where the number of sort of super arms gets into tens of thousands very quickly. And finally, an application that I'm going to talk about today uh, is, is uh, crowdfunding, where uh, it could not, you cannot you really think about this problem without going to the infinite bandit perspective, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about next. This is work with uh, Lalit Jane, my postdoc at UW, um, who has really been spearheading this. So crowdfunding, what is it? When I say crowdfunding, you should be thinking of things like Kickstarter or GoFundMe or these sorts of things, where Let's say I have some you know, new flying car, and I don't have any money because I'm poor, and I need to raise money for this. I need to have uh, the crowd give me money to finance this operation. So I go and I make some website. I say, please pledge $25 on Kickstarter or whatever. Uh, or they say, you know, you know, swipe left and go to the next person, or the next sort of uh, uh, possible opportunity. And so this first person, she likes it. She, she pledges $25. Next person doesn't like it. Next person likes it. Next person likes it. And this funding on the right-hand side is becoming higher and higher. And if they hit their funding goal of $150, it'll get fully funded. And it'll actually get the money. And how these sites work is that unless you hit this reserve price of $150, you don't get funded at all. So if, if, it on, if, you, if they only got to, to here, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the delay is killing me. Uh, if you only got to here, and then it, it was over, you know, for a month, if they only ever reached this amount, the flying car project would never have been fully funded. And it never would have hit the reserve price, and he wouldn't get any money. He'd get zero money. And so what these platforms want to do is they don't want to get everything partially funded. They want to maximize the number of projects that are fully funded and move through this system. So how, what does this have to do with bandits? So like with The New Yorker, this, this company Kiva uh, gives 0% finance loans or 0% interest loans. And what people see when you go to kiva.org is these uh, low-income entrepreneurs want to have different um, have different projects, and they're trying to raise money. This one's looking for uh, 6,000, 1,500, 1,400. And basically, people are asking them for $25 loans. You or I would go on here, we'd, we'd give them $25, and we see how far they have to go. And the idea is that, just like with The New Yorker, when you show up to the site, how are these chosen? Why am I seeing these six loans among the tens of thousands that are on the site at any given time? Right? And that's why this is a bandit problem. We're going to talk about how do we optimize that process? Which ones do we show on that front page? And so our goal is to come up with a mechanism of how do we show these? How do we prioritize different loans so that we can maximize the total number of loans that are pushed through the system that are fully funded? Because there are many, many, many projects. There's tens of thousands of these. Some of the projects are good, and they, they'll be funded very quickly. Some of the projects are terrible, and they'll have no chance of being funded. Very similar to this New Yorker example. There's a small number of good ones, but a vast majority are really, really bad. And because most of them are very, very bad, if you just do a uniform allocation of your, of your resources, say a random sampling of, of, uh, random sampling of the projects that are on the site of these 10,000, what's going to happen is that Basically, all of the projects will get partially funded. Everything will get about 10% funded, but nothing will get fully funded so that this site will be a complete failure in actually getting any projects funded. What we want to do is make very hard decisions and only get a few projects fully funded and many projects not funded at all. Okay? We want to. Sh we want to prioritize which loans we show so that a small number get fully funded and a large number don't. And so these are going to have to be very harsh keep or kill decisions. Yes? Do you have any thoughts on how this objective contrasts with the problem that most companies probably have to show and not show? 
Yes. So in a ad setting, what you're trying to do, or getting people to sign up for a subscription or anything like this, is what you're trying to do is you're trying to maximize click-through rate. If people click that button or if people see that ad, they're getting some amount of click. And so that objective of maximizing the click-through rate is if they are clicking on it, that's great, you're getting revenue, and everything's working great. In this situation, it's a much more difficult situation. Because here, from the ad perspective, we would just run something like UCB or something, get lots of clicks, but then nothing will get fully funded. Because we don't actually get a reward until it's fully funded. And so it's, di it's much more difficult than the ad scenario because we are not caring about getting as many clicks as possible. We're worried about getting as many concentrated clicks on individual projects. And again, there's been this you know, explosion of crowdfunding platforms, Kiva, Kickstarter, Donuts Choose, Indiegogo, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, lots of money in this. Um, but no one's actually looking at this. There's been tons of economics papers on this and business papers uh, about the communities and the economies and all these sorts of things. But no one's really talked about how to optimize these platforms to actually maximize the total number of throughput. And this is what we cared about, because the reason why we got interested in this was actually the CTO of Kiva came to us and asked us, we have this problem. We don't know how to solve it. Uh, we're doing suboptimally. Please help us. So these companies really don't know what to do. There is not a clear model of how to solve this problem. So OK, to map this back to our original bandit problem, we have n projects with pledge rates, you know, mu1 through mu n. So if I show you it, what's the probability they actually click it? There's some reserve price tau. And we say the project fires uh, when it receives tau pledges. And this firing is coming from somewhat like a neuron where you get nothing, you know, you're getting nothing, 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 nothing. And then it finally hits some reserve price, and then it fires. And it goes. OK, so like we were just talking about, you know, how does this differ from like the traditional scenario? What could I possibly do? One thing I could do is I could sample, just like we were doing before, sample n arms from this distribution f, because this, where f now is the pool of projects, these tens of thousands of projects that are on the site at any given time. Run UCB, run low UCB on these, uh, on these n arms. And because low UCB will, co will concentrate all of its uh, pulls on those highest arms, those mean, these arms with the highest means, it will eventually start converting them. Sounds like a great idea. So what happens? So let's say we start. We, this is the true distribution of what the means are in this pool of tens of thousands of loans. And let's say we just sample n equals 200. So this is a random draw of the means from this distribution of size 200. And then we're running UCB. So in the while, you have this burn-in phase that you're always going to have until you get about tau times n. And then as soon as you get past that burn-in phase, that's when start things, the really good ones start to fire. They get rejected. And then as, as those get rejected, they're getting removed from our active set. And so this distribution of how it actually looks over time is getting worse and worse because the good ones are already removed. And so the quality of this distribution is getting worse and worse. And eventually, this continues. And we eventually flatten out. We basically convert all of, the, all of the projects that we were going to convert in the first place. And now we're just stuck with these projects that are really quite bad. And the problem here, what you could say is that, ah, well, I know something about infinite armed bandits. n was too small. You chose n too small because you ran out of projects. You should have just chosen a larger value of n. And I, ha I heard this guy, Kevin, talking about hedging. And I know how to solve this problem now. I should just look at different, I should run different parallel versions of UCB. So one with 10, n equals 10,000, 10,000, 100,000, and then run these different versions of UCB in parallel and just look at the best one. Problem is, that doesn't really make sense. Because what I was talking about before was a pure expiration sort of situation. I was just trying to identify the best one. And I was saying all we did was lose a log factor. But what's really going on, if we did have n equals 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, that's four different games being run in parallel. If only one of those is doing the right thing, that means the other three are doing terribly. So if we're trying to minimize sort of regret, or if we're trying to maximize the throughput, three of the four different games that we're playing in parallel are doing terribly, whereas only one of them is doing the right thing. 
And so what I've been taught with this hedging strategy and you know, pure expiration doesn't really translate into this regret minimization or reward maximization game. The trick here is to realize uh, that the flips of one coin or project, I'm modeling projects as coins, the flips of one coin tells me nothing about the other coins. Right? The only reason in multi-arm bandits why we look at all the different arms, why we would never just sample one arm you know, and then decide to stop pulling it at some point is because we don't know what else is out there. But in this case, in this infinite arm bandit setting, everything is IID. So what we can conclude is that there exists some optimal policy that just looks at a single coin at a time. And looking at the flips of that one coin, it decides when to stop or keep sampling. And so what we can do is turn this into a policy search, where a policy, where we have these coin flips. So if we have a total number of flips, if x of t is the number of heads that we've seen so far after t flips, it's, it's a monotonically increasing sequence because it's the total number of successes or heads we've seen. And as soon as it hits tau, it will fire. But a policy, I don't know what's going on with this. Yeah, sorry. I think this clicker is burning a battery or something. Uh, a policy is defined as keep flipping the coin until it crosses this policy line. And so if the coin, go, if its number of heads goes below pi of t, then you're going to throw it out. If it doesn't, keep flipping it until it hits tau hits. And a policy is just any monotonically increasing function. And so if we have these kind of functions, we can optimize over them, and we can find which one is going to translate into the most uh, project throughput. So different policies, they look like this. They look like different lines. Uh, they can look like quadratics. I mean, it doesn't really matter what these shapes look like. Uh, or they can look like you know, just a vertical line, where basically it's you have 20 flips. If you flip 20 times and you haven't hit tau yet, then you, you move on. And so these fixed budget policies of just, I'm going to flip something 20 times and then decide whether to take it or not, uh, they're kind of convenient. They're simple. They're really simple to out implement. They have nice interpretations. Um, they're also fair. They give people, you can just explain on the website what exactly they're doing. So this is actually the class that we use. Um, and they're also convenient because if you evaluated B flips, if you flipped a coin B times, you also know what it did if I were to have flipped that coin only B prime flips or B prime less than B. And so you can evaluate these things. I'm going to skip through this. Sorry. Uh, we can define this regret notion uh, with respect to this, this policy class of Bs. Uh, there's these fixed policies. T of rho of B star is basically, is basically the, the total number that we possibly expect. I think I must have skipped a slide in one of these transitions at some point, because I didn't define this. Uh, but the point is, with, there's a very natural notion of regret in this situation of how many projects did I convert relative to the best optimal strategy. Uh, and with a very reasonable algorithm that's quite complicated uh, to describe here, you can get this asymptotic, or not asymptotic, this finite time or guarantee on that if you optimize over these policies, you can uh, basically compete with the optimal thing in hindsight. So that uh, the number of projects, as you run this, this scheme for a while, you can actually, uh, basically you're competing with the best strategy in hindsight um, over time. Yeah? Does this algorithm assume that pulls of the same arm in this case, funding a project individually by people, are independent? Yes. Okay. Yes. And how, and how much does it depend on how well you can model the probability of a particular project if like, the, the problem is the coin flip? Yeah, that's a great question. So you're asking, you know, people are coming to this site, they're, they're answering these queries, they have all this other information that allowed that they're looking at. Uh, is it very reasonable to say that these coin flips are actually um, IID and uh, is this a decent model? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, we can see over time that actually showing people how much this, this, this uh, loan has been funded so far is an enormous signal. Um, an enormous predictor of what they're going to be, if they're going to label this thing, or if they're going to fund this thing or not. So it's, it's a very naive model. Um, but even with this extremely naive model, that where all the model assumptions are essentially wrong, 
we can still show that this algorithm point behaves very well. Um, so even under these very uh, poor circumstances. Um, and so this is just an empirical plot of, uh, this is run on historical data that we sort of replayed on. This is what these means look like. Again, you know, 0.15, which is actually a huge click-through rate um, for these sort of things. It's surprisingly large. Uh, and orange is our algorithm. You know, we're beating all these UCB strategies that they have this sort of burn-in time, of course, if n is too big, and then it starts getting good. Um, but then it will also eventually level off. OK, so this algorithm does actually work. Uh, and we are implementing it at Kiva uh, with them right now. Um, and so it's great. You know, we get to get this, uh, this nonprofit um, some help in actually maximizing this throughput of this system. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So, yeah, I think that uh, random is a very naive baseline. Uh, you could come up with different prioritizations, you know, some heuristic of, yeah, the amount of it's been funded or some other, you know, some hotness sort of metric, and then prioritizing and ordering them that way. Uh, this is actually a heuristic that Kiva uses, something like this. Um, and we, we've actually replayed on their data versus our data, or versus our algorithm on their own data. And uh, we've shown that we can actually beat those heuristics. And the reason why is just because like, we're optimizing for something. We're going to do every little thing we can to actually maximize this thing, uh, whereas they have a fixed policy that might not behave very well. But yes, there's certainly things that we're missing and leaving on the table. OK. So all these examples, as we've just been talking about, uh, rely strongly on stochastics, meaning that we, have, we can build confidence intervals. They have coins, these are IID flips. And so we can rely on turnoff bounds and Huffington inequalities, these sorts of things. But sometimes we don't have such a predictable convergence rate to the true mean. For instance, uh, what if we're doing gradient descent on optimization? Right? Non-convex optimization, we have some very complicated surface. And one way I like to solve this problem is by just random restarts, right? You uniformly at random, pick some point in the domain. This, you, the kth one is some point in the domain, and then you just run gradient descent for t iterations. Everyone's very familiar with this. OK, I'm going to stop using that. Uh, everyone's very familiar with this. What you'll see is plots like this. For each one of these choices of k, you do this many, many trials. And what you see is that these, they, they have initial progress, and they slow down, and they converge to a local minima. Right? And what we like to do is be able to identify, well, you know, these things are converging to a local minima. These things, you know, as I have these sequence, this theta k is converging to something, but it's not a mean. Right? It's not, it's not an, an empirical process that is an unbiased estimate each time I'm taking the average of these coin flips. It's all we really know is that if we keep running this thing as t goes out to infinity for each of the kth repetition, it will converge to some limiting value. And what we can do, actually, to map this back to the problems that we've been talking about this whole time, is that what we've done is we've placed some measure over our starting conditions. Right? We're uniformly at random starting these k uh, repetitions uh, in 0, 1 to the d. And then we're running them for t iterations, and they're eventually converging to something. So by having this uniform measure over the domain, that induces a measure on the limiting values that they see. And if we interpret that of the means that we've been talking about this entire time, we now say we can have this actual PDF or uh, this distribution over these limiting values, just as we had a distribution over the means. And now, of course, there's no finite number of means that we have. There's no finite number of limiting starting positions. It's infinite. It's uncountably infinite. And so how do we trade this off? How do we trade off the fact that, you know, how, trade off the number of iterations we go to versus the total number of repetitions that we have? The real trouble here is that we don't know how quickly these things converge. We don't know the rate at which each individual function evaluation, this f of theta k at time t, converges to its final value. 
they could be different, but we also just don't know them. You know, we have bounds, uh, we have theoretical bounds on these quantities, but they're extremely loose and not useful for practice. I don't think anyone in this room has ever used, you know, a, a, a bound from Nesterov to actually use a stopping condition. I mean, you're just using some heuristic to stop. So you can come up with a different algorithm. To deal with this, can we, can we deal with this unknown convergence rate? And the answer is yes. It's a very, very simple algorithm. I've used it in a number of different works, analyzed it in different settings because it's just so beautiful and so simple. You don't need to read it. What it is, if I have a budget, I'm going to have, I start with some budget and I flip or, and I, I run everything for t iterations. Okay? I have my n guys that run each one for t iterations. I look at the best half. I let them go for another. So I, sorry, I sample, I run for t iterations, I, I throw out the worst half, and the ones that survived, I run for twice as long. And I throw out the worst half, I run for twice as long. Throw out the worst half, run for twice as long. This ratio of throwing out a fraction and going for that inverse fraction twice as long for that many more steps is this very beautiful uh, process. And you can prove that it has this amazing property that this is eventually going to stop. You're eventually going to get to one alternative, and you can show that if your budget, the initial budget that you started with, is greater than this very disgusting looking thing, then in your n, the number of arms that you started with is bigger than this, which should look familiar. It's just 1 over the 1 minus thing, the condition on n before, because now we're minimizing and not maximizing. Sorry if the notation change. Then we can get that we're returning an arm that's at least epsilon good. And what's important about this is that we didn't need not, did not need to know gamma. We just need to pick n. Well, how do you pick n? This is a pure expiration game, and we can do the same sort of hedging that we did before. Try different values of n. For, for a fixed value of b, we try values of n that are equal to, say, b over 10, b over 100, b over 1,000, et cetera. Uh, there's exceptions for that paper that I referenced before in the stochastic setting where you can do much, much better. Now I'm just going to fly through this. We've only got a couple minutes left. Uh, everyone in this room knows about hyperparameters and how much of a pain it is to actually tune them. And hyperparameter tuning is a lot like uh, gradient descent. It's a lot like gradient descent with random restarts. Because instead of the, the descent function, what we're actually evaluating is the test error on these uh, descended uh, hyperparameters. And the problem is that evaluating these things is very long. It takes a very long time. It can take weeks to evaluate a current model if you're training from beginning to end. And so if we have parallelism, we can evaluate, say, k at the same time. But that still doesn't really help. Because if you have, say, uh, 10 hyperparameters, then to cover this space, you're going to need an exponential number uh, in the dimension uh, of, of evaluations. Meaning the number of, if you have 10 hyperparameters, you're going to need something like at least you know, 2 to the 10 uh, different models or different settings of hyperparameters to actually evaluate all the corners and everything. And so what you can actually show is that you know, random search is actually pretty competitive with these Bayesian optimization schemes in this regime where the number of hyperparameters is very large. And what you can do, once you have this conclusion that random sampling is actually pretty competitive, meaning within a factor of two or three, then what you can really just focus on is speeding up random search. And the way they can read up, span, speed up random search is exactly by these early stopping techniques. Exactly what we've been talking about with uh, this gradient descent and all these sort of things, using these uh, success of having this run for some amount of time, throw out the worst half, run for twice as long. And what these algorithms look like is this would be non-adaptive. This is asynchronous running. This is non-adaptive. You're just, once you're done, you start over and start off from the beginning. And this is 10 workers working in parallel. But then what the adaptive algorithm will look like, instead of two, you know, running for some amount of time, throw out the worst half, run for twice as long, we can parameterize this with eta. We can run for some amount of time, throw out the worst one over eta, and run for eta as long, eta times longer. And what this algorithm would look like, it's just an asynchronous version of the algorithm I just presented, it would look like this. And so this is this the same, this is non-adaptive versus adaptive on the same time span. They got the same amount of time with 10 workers. And the point here is that because we're doing a very, very aggressive early stopping, we're only letting one over eta of those through that got past this point. We can see that uh, it can look at 
basically 92 configurations versus 16. And so if this aggressive downsampling is OK, then we can get this huge gain because we can look at a lot more, and we can get a better observation at the end. OK, and so uh, we've evaluated this sort of scheme on a number of different data sets, uh, a ResNet versus non-adaptive uh, with 50 workers, another ConfNet, an LSTM uh, with 20 workers, but 125 CPUs each. Um, for LSTMs, it tends to work very well, actually, uh, with, with this particular setup, actually, because um, in these sort of models, it, we observe that basically you either hit a good hyperparameter setting or you don't, and there's not much signal of being close. And so you have to, do, you know, there's not much thing better than random search. Uh, we also compare it to Vizier, which is Google's internal hyperparameter service that also has, uh, that uses some Gaussian process optimization, much like it's basically a professional version of something like uh, Spearmint or these sorts of things. Um, and what we see that it's competitive with us. We have these different versions of brackets, but ignore those. Just look at hyperband. This is this dark blue line. And so we're actually uh, beating Vizier over five trials on this PTB data set, this LSTM data set. And what you might say, oh, but that's not using early stopping. Well, Vizier also has an early stopping strategy that's outlined in their paper. And we actually beat it by quite a huge margin. It's actually random sampling is beating it with it totally non-adaptive. Why? Because this scheme is trying to extrapolate to the learning curve. It's trying to extrapolate how these things work. They became confident in incorrect belief. They spit the lines incorrectly, and they have extremely large variance. And so sometimes they did just as well as us, and sometimes better, and sometimes far worse. And the question becomes, you know, when you're running this on your data set, how do you know if you're one of the good ones or the bad ones? We also compare it against Fabulous, uh, where there's a big backstory to this that I'm not going to go into. We have to talk about it offline. But we win on a number of data sets. We're not a new idea. Lots of people have looked at this. What's new in this work is that we, uh, previous works explicitly model convergence behavior. We're completely agnostic to it. And this is what allows us to have these big gains. Um, so that's all I really want to talk about today and try to give you a conceptual overview of if we think about these problems not as having n large number of alternatives and how do we identify them, but if we have these large action spaces, we should really be thinking about these as a distribution of actions, and that we're really always trying to find you know, a pretty good one. And sometimes problems are very easy, sometimes they're very hard. And if you have a large action space and actions, your true problem, this true sample complexity, should not ever scale with the number of actions you have. It should scale with the true intrinsic uh, dimensionality or difficulty of the problem. Thank you.